Mach 3, give me cruise show on 2, 3, and 4. Come on, one, two, one. Six, three. Mach 3, give me start line 2. 5 electric. Mach 3, come on up. Mach 3, give me start line 1. And cruise show on 7 and 9. Line 1. Hey, I'll do something. I hate that place. Super Ops, line 3, Red Ball, Avionics. Super Ops. Line 7 is code 3 for Flickas. Fuck. Hey, so I started a Patreon because frankly, this stuff's getting expensive. Nothing will change the podcast or the blog if you don't subscribe, but if you want early access to episodes, monthly AMAs, episode shoutouts, voting on podcast topics, and all kinds of 20 Years Done gear, head over to patreon.com slash 20 years done. This month's top tier Patreon shoutout goes to Robbie Walker, Travis Barnes, Kevin Traw, JT Owens, Delinda Baker, and Matt Jones. Thanks for the support. Okay, so today I'm joined by Nate Gear, a gentleman that I served with well, I'm not sure if served is the right term because I was still serving and you had since separated and you were working for AFITS at Luke Air Force Base. Yep. Um, we met in the summer of 2013, working a really sort of complex uh, impound. I don't think you knew me before that impound. And I don't think I knew you. No, um, I'd seen you around in the office in the, in the AMU, but yeah. uh, it's, then, I would say we suffered together. That's fair. <laughs> and then uh, afterwards, we both figured out we knew what we were doing. Uh, and we stayed in contact thereafter. And then later when I did contract work, you were actually like the oversight for the contract. Um, mm-hmm. I was trying to explain it to a friend of mine before the podcast started. It's like you were the oversight person. So when you come out the line, there was like this dark cloud and everybody like avoided you. And I'd walk right up and people, I think people thought I was a plant or something. I was a management. It was, uh, like it that. was epic QA. It was QA for QA for QA. And, yeah, so uh, I, that's almost like a persistent uci sort of format because you were evaluating the qa either through watching what we do or watching what qa would do mm-hmm. which is essentially an ori or uci but it's yeah. like persistent yeah it's just full-blown contract oversight and uh it was i think it was rough on maintainers i felt kind of bad <laughs> yeah so today we're going to talk about uh affits but both mm-hmm. with you as an affits person the role of affits and what I have seen AFITS kind of morph into uh, throughout my career. And I'm interested in your take as well. So okay. I guess if you could, I'm, you know, I I assume you've probably done the mission orientation briefings where you'd explain this is what AFITS is. Have you ever had to do one of those back in the day? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Great. We, so, would, we would go through the mission O and I would be the guy, you know, designated to do it because I was the new guy and all the other guys didn't want to do it. Um, so, so do, it, uh, any, do it again in like three minutes. Okay. So basically AFITS is a uh, Air Force engineering technical support. And uh, it's all former maintainers that separated or retired and decided to uh, still contribute or want to contribute. And we do pretty much the liaison between the regular flight line maintainer and the manufacturer of whatever system we're working on, uh, i.e. helicopters. F-35, F-15, whatever. So um, we get in the weeds with very technical problems. And uh, if it comes down to box swapping, we don't want to get involved. So, yeah. But we also do training because of the, fall, the uh, shortfalls in FTD. Interesting. Yeah, so our interaction was, I think I wrote about it in one of my articles. Uh, I'll link it if I did. Uh, we worked a very complicated impound. It was a repeat for a uh, anti-skid failure, combination brake failure. And that was my, that was a, ironically, that was an impound of all master sergeants and AFITs. Like when I say all master sergeants, it was all master sergeants were the technicians doing the job with AFITs like out there with us all day, every day. Um, and that was my first time really seeing AFITs doing more deep work or hands-on work because Prior to that, I'd only seen AFITs as technical advisors. Yeah. And and that's the way when I got hired on, it was explained to me, you are a technical advisor. You are no longer a maintainer. Like they had to actually pull me aside because I'm more proactive. I like getting my hands dirty. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to go into AFITs is because I can still work those hard broke problems and still contribute. Right. 
I like the hard broke stuff. I volunteered for the hard broke stuff when I was wearing a uniform. So, um, they pulled me aside multiple times and they're like, you are an advisor, not a technician. And I'm like, and I would, that would go one in one ear and out the other. I'm like, okay, go away. You don't see what I'm doing out here. And I'm going to help these guys pull parts and, and dig in. I was like, you can only watch somebody shoot wires or shake down a harness so many times for you. Like, all right, get out of the way. I'm going to show you how to really do it. So also you talked about when you're in uniform, what was your job when you're in the military? How long were you in the military for and what, what, uh, what ranks, I guess, what was your job? What was your AFSC and also what positions did you hold before you separated? So I started out as a B1 avionics technician out of Dias Air Force Base. And back then we were shredded A, B, C shop. So A shop was, you know, radar, B shop was flight control, C shop was radar threat warning. Um, that was a really good assignment, but I realized that once you're in the bomber community and you're on a base, you don't leave ever. Uh, I knew guys who were on the same base for 20 years. Um, so I cross-trained in F-16 avionics because there was more F-16 bases and we were not shredded. So I was an A shopper who is now in charge of, or not in charge of, but responsible for all systems on the airplane. So that was eye-opening. And I actually had a line number when I cross-trained into F-16s. So I had to get my seven level real quick. A line number for staff sergeant? For staff sergeant, yeah. Um, so I did a total of nine years. So so four years on B1s and five years on F-16s. So what was that like going from the, and I'll, I'll probably talk shreds too when we get a little bit deeper in this conversation, mm -hmm. kind of talking about experience and stuff. But what was it like going from a, a shredded, uh, career field to a non shred career field and had to get your seven level, which is a, is a requirement of basically being maybe not an expert on everything, but proficient on everything. Right. Yeah. It would, it would be the equivalent of taking a nice stroll through the park and then being dropped off in the middle of the New York marathon. Yeah. Um, that, and especially when you show up with a line number, you know, and they're expecting a lot of you. And they're like, we don't care where you came from. We don't care if you cross train, uh, catch up. And I was like, okay, let's go. So, um, I liked the challenge. It was hard. Um, when I got in the F 16 community and I saw the sortie generation and stuff like that, I was like, holy shit, what is going on? So B ones, I mean, we launched two sorties in the morning and they don't come back till swings. They're yeah. doing 10 hour missions. So, Okay, so AFITS, we kind of talked about that it's it's technical advisors. When so when I was an airman, I I don't think I knew what AFITS was as an airman. Uh, there I was, didn't either. It, it wasn't talked about. There was certainly as an airman, there was no there was no interaction at all um, with AFITS. And I think the first time I met AFITS was when I was in engine run class because AFITS was the engine run certifier um, for engine run. In my experience, especially towards the very end of my career when I was in at Holloman and probably a little bit at Luke as well, AFIT's involvement seemed to really amp up since like 2014, 2013 ish is when AFIT's, and I saw that at Luke and I saw that at Holloman, uh, but as somebody that's, that's done AFIT's, did you hear anything? from your AFITS people serving around the world that was uh, similar or, or I guess was the experience of AFITS being more involved at those two bases or at least at Luke unique in your experience? So I think it's dependent on who your AFITS person is. Like I said, I'm proactive. I like getting in all the, the bad stuff, you know, figuring, figuring out problems and interacting with people and, and just, I like knowing what's going on with those airplanes. You know, I was always, I, I like to think I was out there as much as possible when I was at Luke. And the way I saw it was those guys are my customer. If my customers aren't happy, then I'm not doing my job. There were definitely a lot of guys in AFITS that were very sit at the desk for eight hours and wait for the phone to ring. It's just how, however they wanted to do their job. You know, I didn't, I'm not a sit at desk kind of person. Um, I did the same thing as Shaw. Um, there at Shaw, we had a lot of proactive guys, like everybody in the office was always out on the line. We weren't necessarily always 
getting in the weeds with everybody and helping them fix stuff, but we interacted with them and we let them knew we were there for help. Yeah, I guess I should, I guess I should separate or tease out some of the points you're making because they're good points. Like, here's how I would see a very healthy affits, either shop or representative. It would be mm -hmm. you have a subject matter experts, so people that are legit, certainly either in that in that realm, like avionics generally, or even better specific to that airframe in particular, where they have this big kind of reservoir of experience they can pull from. They understand how the components are interrelated to each other and how certain symptoms can manifest other things. That's like ideal for experience, knowledge and system knowledge, but also, yeah, being out on the line. Like when I was a pro super on swing shift, Walking the line probably gave me more information on the health of the fleet and what was going on than any meeting I would get or any update I would get from my expediters. So very often I would build a schedule, do the nightly meeting with all the expediters, and then I wouldn't have, have much to do. And I would pick up and walk from hangar to hangar and check parking locations, but also see, okay, this is the one that's broke for the no start. Let me go talk to them, see what they're thinking. Let me get an idea and let me kind of like share, well, do we think it's fuel or spark or any of these conversations that are like really organic and it's just trying for me to impart some knowledge into that person while they're working. That's what I see a uh, really healthy affits force doing where they're, if they're out walking yeah. the line, they know if they're at the morning meeting, they know which jets are hard broke, which jets have been hard broke for days, which jets are hard broke for their systems and kind of be bopping out without any sort of threat of QA or a fail or, or a supervisor or anything. You're just like, yeah, an independent person that isn't going to judge you for what you're doing necessarily. And they're just trying to help guide you in the direction for fixing the jet. Like that is proactive. It is out from the desk. And I think it's a very, and it's, you're being a technical advisor. You're advising not necessarily the commander or the chief, you're advising the senior airman or staff sergeant of. Yeah. That's hey, my that, bread and butter. Yeah, that may not hands on work, maintainers. Right. Yeah. So, but what I saw was, towards the tail end, AFIT's moving from that, while it's proactive, it's more passive advising, where it's mm -hmm. just like communicating and maybe putting hands on every once in a while to like check the wire, you know what I mean? Yeah. To almost leading troubleshooting. Okay. Where AFIT's was, that was the person that was answering for what the status of the jet was. They're the one making maybe not the decisions for which way to go, but they would say, this is the way we're going to go. And everybody would kind of defer. So it was like a, a de facto sort of decision maker. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And um, I think a lot of that, a lot of that happened without us realizing it. Cause now that you mention it that way, I remember like outside of the impound official, like I went everywhere with the impound official when you were the impound official. Yeah. Um, we had to brief supervision about what was going on. And I think that happened because of the level of experience of the younger technicians is they didn't have that pool of experienced seven levels to be like, you're a staff, you're an experienced staff or tech, you go uh, work this jet with athletes because those guys were uh, expediters. Yeah. I mean, there's a handful of times where I, I was like, I saw a senior airman with a line number uh, expediting on a shift when he was probably the most experienced guy and probably should have been working on that hard broke, but he can, he's got to manage those 14 airplanes. Yeah. So um, I think it, it, one didn't happen because of the other. It's, it's just. Well, I yeah. guess, I guess I would ask you as somebody that had a good amount of experience, right? Like getting picked up for AFITs, it's not like, uh, certainly not a guarantee. If you separate from the military, you can get an AFITs job. Like I've known, I know for a fact that AFITs is a very competitive and you need to be uh, a kind of a top performer uh, in, in, in your career field and, and for that airframe in order to get, kind of get picked because the reality is- Sometimes. <laughs> some, okay, that's fair, sometimes. But I think for the AFITs were, I think a lot of the times you see some good candidates go up for AFITs and, and very often they're selected. Sometimes it's it's much like many things in the military. Uh, they have to fill the slot. So if there aren't good candidates, they're still going to put somebody in the slot type of deal. Exactly. But there I would are... ask you, as somebody okay. that had this, this a lot of experience in system knowledge, how hard was it? Because, you know, we, we talked about how AFITs had been, you know, you were seeing this lack of experience and you were becoming more and more involved in the maintenance. How frustrating was it 
to see people that were so far behind what you thought a senior airman or staff should be for you to withdraw and like and and give them the room to i mean watching some like i'll admit when i was a pro super and i watched somebody do a jfs cocktail it just enrages me because it's like this is not a fix yeah. it's not a thing you're wasting time you're wasting my time you're wasting money you're not doing anything you're not learning anything and then i would get involved and that's probably where some of my micromanagement kind of crept in because it's like I i'm gonna be the puppet master here because this puppet sucks um but as an affix person you're a little bit further removed but in the chain but you're closer in relationship during the maintenance so how hard is it to watch people struggle with something that you think they should know? Uh, it was extremely painful. And um, that's one of those things is uh, I have to remind myself I'm not a supervisor. I'm not their supervisor. Um, so I can't, you know, treat them the same way as you would a subordinate or whatever. But when I walk out and I see a senior airman checking for voltage and he's using like an ohms setting or a resistance yeah. setting on a meter, I'm like, I got to call, I'll stop and actually get in there, fix the problem and then step back out. Mm. Um, my thing was, that was the hardest thing to do is get in there, help them and make sure I remove myself again and let them just give them enough rope. Um, Cause they're not going to learn anything if I do it for them. Um, it was very difficult. And when I started seeing the experience level slide and one stripers, there's, a one striper is training another one striper on how to do something. And I'm like, yeah. you gotta be kidding me. And it was more of an advanced task. Um, and then staff sergeants driving the truck, um, who just barely sewed on, which it can be done. We've all done it, you know, but, uh, it was really hard. Yeah. When I think of a staff sergeant that just sewed on driving the truck, my natural inclination is to think that he was the breadwinner for whatever shift he was on probably. Yeah. And if he's going into the truck because he's the most capable and there's a there's a vacancy, you're also losing you're, one of two things happening. Either you're losing your lead technician to the truck or what's probably more likely happening is your lead technician is now balancing the truck and being a lead technician at the same time, which Absolutely. is an impossible workload. Yep. He's he's not only driving around figuring out what his guys are doing and where they're at. He's also troubleshooting from the seat and he's troubleshooting multiple air, you know, jets at a time. And while trying to manage a flying schedule and you'd see these 25, 26 year old dudes that are just completely fried. Yeah. And he, I was like, you'd talk to him and he's like, dude, I, I, I'm trying, but I can't keep up. And then also what they're also probably doing is training each jet crew at, mm -hmm. for that five minutes that are out there getting a status update, signing an X or looking something over, they're doing a very light touch training all over. So yeah. instead of doing a deep dive in training, here's the theory of operation. Let's get this commit. Like that was my, whenever I talk about my time in troubleshooting where I really learned it was because in 2004, I think it was, I was just slammed with no starts, but my expediter would let me struggle it would change mm -hmm. this and change this and then uh, when i'd run the fi would run out of things and it's like okay what do you mean you ran out of things like uh, i didn't fix it i did all the things you said to do and it's still not starting what are you doing here you'd be like yeah get the theory of operation and get the schematic and i want you to run through figure out where you're failing and then look at the schematic and see the things that command or derive a command from and i'm like oh okay yeah. but that's like yep. That's something you can't do in five minutes where if you're split between being an expert and the lead seven level for avionics or whatever, you're riding around trying to catch all. And by the way, catching all the X's as an expert while concurrently training people is absolutely a recipe for disaster to yep. either, you know, we talk about like people are complacent or people are pencil whip IPIs, but the reality is, and I've said this probably more times than I can count, the culture and maintenance incentivizes and promotes corner cutting because you can't get currently you cannot get your mission done without cutting corners and violating regulations period yes like that's that's an i agree it, that's like it, it's it's an uncomfortable truth and there's probably a lot of people that refuse to believe it but i i suspect there's a lot of maintainers nodding um along right now because mm -hmm. it is absolutely true um but i want to go back to uh 
the the experience you had as Affitz where um you know juxtaposing your experience as a technician versus the line maintainers uh what like compare those ones you saw as a staff sergeant towards the end of your time at Affitz compared to when you were a young airman in like when, when were you an airman like the mid 2000s uh so i enlisted in 98 so early okay. 2000s yeah so yeah me and you enlisted okay we enlisted at the same time so yeah think about the staff sergeants in 1998 1999 2000 oh my God. and compare and, and and also like I, I brought this up a few times and I don't want to get caught in some boomer cognitive dissonance cycle here. No, no. I'm not no. saying that current staff sergeants are worse than staff sergeants in 1998. What I'm trying to say is staff sergeants in 1998 had a lot more experience that they were allowed to get because, um, you know, part of it's probably for that mid 90s squeeze where we let a bunch of people out and these staff sergeants we saw in the early 2000s had basically mm -hmm. had to grow in a sort of restricted environment where they didn't have a choice. But being able to rely on staff sergeants in the late 90s, early 2000s, they had this tremendous foundation of experience to pull from. And staff sergeants these days are not given that same foundation, but their yeah. the ex the expectations are the same is what I'll say. But I don't want to talk too much. Well, if you had to compare staff sergeants today to staff sergeants in the late nineties, what would you think? So, so I can't speak to the fighter community back then. Um, I can speak to the heavies community. So I remember getting on the flight line and I got on a truck and there are four to five staff sergeants on my shift. There's three other senior airmen and all four staff sergeants are looking at me like, why don't you have a GS in your lap? sitting, you know, and they're asking me constant questions and they would be the kind of guys, they were like gods, you know, they knew their stuff and they, they would take you out, show you one time and watch you do it the next. And then you're on your own because you have a TO. And if you came to them with a question, they knew the answer, but they would help you find your way through it. They were extremely experienced. Um, any one shift would have four to five very experienced people um, just in the E5 rank. Um, when I cross-trained into 16s and I got to Luke in late 0304, there was still a good, there was a lot more people. So ratio-wise, there was still a good number of staff sergeants that were very, very smart when I got there. Um, and I could pull that, that knowledge from those guys. Towards the end of my career, um, when, I, when I got out of AFITS, it seems like there was one good staff sergeant on shift, one guy. And the senior airmen weren't, you know, they weren't far behind him, but like they, the entire AMU or entire shop would lean on one guy really hard for experience. And you can just see that guy getting burned out. Yep. Um, a lot of that happened. So like when you and I met, that was during the time when a lot of drawdown was happening, yep. people weren't enlisting. So that was another uh, cause. Um, we just didn't have the people. Um, and then it was still do more with less. And we're all about that. We can make that work, but it was legitimately, you're going to do the same with a whole lot less. And, um, the whole, the whole shop relying on one decent guy per shift or saying, Hey, this guy's on mids. We got to wait till he comes in because he knows yep. what's going on. And I'm like that. You can't operate like this. Um, especially with the age of the aircraft, you're getting the, the, the aircraft are aging out. They're breaking harder. Um, I, I came in on the 16s on block 25s and then we go to block 40s and block 50s. Nobody's seen those problems unless you worked block 25. Yep. Um, so we started getting more problems on block 40s and 50s and 50s at Shaw. And I'm looking around the room at techs and staffs and they've been on 50s their whole career. And they're like, has anybody seen this before? And I'm like, well, I have. And they're like, how do you know? And I'm like, well, I cut my teeth on 25s. I was like, that's, we're in the same, band, you know, general time band, same yeah. band, time band of failure. So, um, I remember sitting in, in a, uh, group morning meeting at Shaw and there was 30 people in that room from staff to chief. And I was the guy over in the corner and everybody's like, has anybody seen this? And I'm looking around and I'm like, ah, and I was still six months new to Athens and I raised my hand. And everybody in the room's looking at me and I'm like, oh shit, I better know what I'm talking about. 
And uh, it was the exact same problem I'd seen on a block 25. Um, so it's, it's generationally for the airplanes. It's generationally for the people. Uh, it's, it's, it's personnel drawdowns that happened during yours and my time. Um, but the experience level is just not there and the guys don't have time to catch up. So here's what I'll say too. Uh, I posit that current AFIT's culture of being more involved in troubleshooting and the maintenance more direct is a symptom of a broadly inexperienced force that, that yeah. takes longer to return aircraft to a, you know, a, a functional mission capable status. So because it's taking longer, AFITS is getting more and more involved, leaning on their experience for the last 20 or so years, however long that AFITS person has. What happens when the AFITS people start retiring and we're backfilling with the people that lack experience now? Uh, exactly. I don't have an answer for that. I, um, I think we're, we're going to rely more on FSRs, field service reports, uh, 107s. And, um, in my opinion, I mean, I'm sure we'll get into the 107 thing, but, yeah. uh, oh yeah, but it's, um, we're going to go out more to the engineers. We're going it, to, it's going to, the experience level is going to degrade, but we're going to keep punting it up to the engineers. And, and I guess let's address the elephant in the room. How do people get experience? Keep fixing broke shit. Time, right? Time, time. I mean, I told all my guys to volunteer for stuff, you know, is they're like, Hey, who wants to go work this broke flight control thing? It's been, it's been broke since Tuesday. Uh, it's now Friday. You know, like, well, you might have to work weekend duty, but I'm like, Hey, I'll work it. I don't care. You know, stick me in a hangar 12 hours a day. Let's go work it. We'll get it fixed. And you got it fixed in two days. So, so like, it seems the fix is it's going to take more, like the less experienced your people are, the more time it's going to take them to fix jets, because through the course of fixing the jet, they're learning through failures. Like, that's, yeah. I mean, there's, 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 I know this sounds almost patronizing anybody listening, but I have to be patronizing at this point because the Air Force has thoroughly fucked it up. So oh, if, yeah. if they've thoroughly fucked it up, I got to talk at the lowest possible level. In order to get experience, it takes time. In that time, you're going to have failures and you're going to go, okay, that didn't fix it. And I need a little bit of extra time to go, why didn't that fix it? Like, if you remember at our impounds, very often we would have meetings at the end of the day of what do I think it is? why do I think it is? And can anybody point out why I'm wrong can poke holes in, mm -hmm. in what I think it is. And if it can survive scrutiny, we'll add it to the list of this is potentially what's, what's causing it type of deal. And that's yeah. like an important part of growing an experience too, is being able to reflect on why it worked, what, what didn't work and why didn't it work. And that takes time. And every time a commander or super or chief or whoever gets impatient that th something is taking too long. Um, two things happen. It promotes quarter cutting because people are trying to shortcut to the fix. And then two, it also is going to create pressure of let's do affids, let's do 107s, let's do all these other things that are, I mean, essentially even that impound that you were, you and I were involved in, we took three master sergeants that were subject matter experts. And we put them in there and we had a single airman with us who did tools like that was yeah. it. But also we taught him as much as we could. Yeah. Like, Hey, come here, look at this. <laughs> what an opportunity lost of if we had more airmen involved, it might've taken a little bit longer, but we could have imparted so much knowledge in that. And that's also part of that time is you need an experienced person to be able to impart that knowledge. But if the air force's current uh, recipe is, Give them a little bit of time. If it's not there, let's do a 107. Let's get AFITs involved or let's get these. I mean, I think that mass sergeant team was a little bit out of left field. I think it worked really well, but it was out of left field. But I think yeah. the go-to a lot of time is have AFITs get involved. And if AFITs involvement is more than just a proactive, passive advisor, and they're starting to take on more of a leadership role in the troubleshooting, you are removing the, the time for that person to fail. And it's, it's a Band-Aid fix and it's short-term. But in 10, 15 years from now, 
because a lot of the AFITS guys aren't your age. A lot of the AFITS guys are in their 50s and 60s, or not mm -hmm. a lot, but some, a, like a, a significant amount. When they age out, they have to like replenish into AFITS. And I'm worried the reality is those same staff sergeants that we have not given the resources to become experienced are going to start becoming our AFITS persons. And now we've lost the ability to, to lean on AFITS anymore. Yeah. Then and you're going, you're basically hiring at your lowest experience level. Um, I'll go back to your, the thing we need more is time. I think time equals people. Uh, yep. People give you the time. Um, if there's more people in the shop, then you can afford the time for these guys to go over here and troubleshoot and learn and, and um, the, everybody else can go swap parts and launch jets and whatever. Um, so it's interesting. You talk about the other, the new generation of AFITS guys coming in. When I was at Shaw, my first uh, AFITS assignment at Shaw was in 2009. Um, one of the guys I worked with there, I taught him all the time. He worked in phase dock. Um, for some reason, all our broke jets got hauled down to phase and we worked shoulder, you know, shoulder to shoulder a lot over three years. He is now an AFITS guy. He is extremely intelligent. Um, I consider myself a jack of all trades, master of none. Like I know a lot of stuff. I mean, I know a little bit about a lot of stuff so that mm -hmm. can help me out. Um, I'm not a perfect expert on any one thing. This guy, when it comes to avionics stuff and electrical hard broke, you know, low voltage stuff, this guy is super smart. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's just on another level. He knows stuff a lot of the older experienced guys don't know. Um, and he's actually at Luke right now. So I'm glad that he got hired on. Um, a lot of the younger guys, uh, I don't see, I don't see them, uh, fill in the shoes of a lot of athletes dudes, yeah. um, when and, they age out. And again, this isn't a knock. What I'm saying is, no. is a lot of the guys now have it's not, a reality have, and they have not been given the opportunity to grow because growth is expensive in order mm -hmm. to grow and develop people. It takes time and resources. And you're absolutely right. Time does equal people. When man hours is a is the most basic concept for anything. It takes two people one hour to do it or one person two hours to do it. The more people you have, the more time you're going to save. And when it comes to maintenance in particular, you're talking about concurrent or batched maintenance. If all your seven levels are on flyers, then especially for crew chiefs, they have to catch their jet or if their day shift launch recover and all the other stuff, they can't barely do anything. But if they're on swing shift, you have to catch their jet, pre-flight it, likely turn their forms over to somebody else to pull it. They've still lost two to three hours on their shift before they can even start working. And, and again, broken record, Chris here, when you basically tell your people you can't go home until stuff's fixed and you can't start working on the broke stuff until this flyer's done, spoiler, they're going to cut corners on their pre-flight because they need to get it done as soon as possible. Like yep. when you don't have experience and you don't have time, quality is going to trend down. Like it's, it's not a complex thing I'm saying. So more people and more, like those two things, I, I don't understand. Again, I did not have an illustrious career. I was not at the highest levels of military service. I think it's utterly ridiculous that a mostly AETC master sergeant can see like critical failures in force management and seemingly no one else at the Pentagon is seeing these things or saying these things, or if they are, they're, they're not sounding the alarm that I think they should be sounding. Yeah. Um, and the episode after this, I'm going to have a, a pilot on to talk about pilot retention and how those are interrelated to oh, the time. I mean, it's, it's essentially a, a, uh, paradox that mm -hmm. I've argued you need it. We need, we soon need to start developing um, time travel so we can go back and fix mistakes because at this yeah. point I think it's almost an impossible ask, but I guess. The can I touch on, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, you're good. Can I touch on one thing and, and, and just, um, and talking about trying to get the younger guys into AFITS. Um, one of the things I noticed is I started seeing a lot of the guys age out, um, in, you know, 2014, 2015, 2016, and I started to see a lot of experienced staffs and techs getting ready and talking about separating. And I tried to, to recruit them into AFITS. I was like, you are no shit, smart guy. You know your stuff. 
what do you think about coming over to Affitz? And they're super excited about it. And they're like, this would be awesome. And we talk to them about it. And then you start talking to them about how they, we PCS, Mm -hmm. you know, just like guys in uniform, we deploy Mm -hmm. just like guys in uniform. Um, we, we do the bag drag, we do all that stuff. Um, I deployed with Shaw multiple times and you get guys that have, are trying to separate at 12 years, 13 years. And they're like, I don't want to do that anymore. They're like, I really like doing what I do. And I was like, you know, how would you like to work just hard broke stuff? You don't have to deal with the management and supervision and all this stuff. And you come into work and you just work hard stuff and you fix stuff because those guys like fixing stuff. Mm-hmm. We're all mechanics at heart. We just like to resolve problems. Yep. And we lost a lot of guys. I think we lost a lot of recruitment potential because of the rotation requirement for AFITS. Um, a lot of guys don't want to do that. You get a 12 year tech um, at Luke and he's got kids in school. He's got a home, he's established. And he goes, I just want to separate and retire. You know, I just don't want to go anywhere. Um, I think that's a big problem with AFITS in, in not uh, recruiting the right people and the strong enough people is the uh, rotation requirement. So I guess there's, there. I see two ways to look at this issue. First is, can AFITs change their model of less PCSs, less deployments, or have positions that are non-deployable, non-PCSable? Is that a feasible fix? I don't know because, and I don't want to, I don't want to speculate sure. on policy regarding uh, going into USAFE or um, going to the Pacific area because there's, there's certain rules on having GS employees in country for so long. Okay. But at the same time, we have GS employees that work on those bases that have been there for a decade. Yeah. You know, um, most guys, when we go overseas, we rotate in three to five years. Um, we can extend to like seven. You know, I'm 18 months removed from AFIT, so things might have changed. But um, things can be done. I mean, we, we had a lot of conversations in AFIT about changing the rotation policy, and that's why people were jumping ship, not retaining. That was one of the reasons I actually got out of AFITS is um, I PCS and uh, uh, deployed more as an AFITS than I ever did in uniform. Interesting. Um, which was great. It was an awesome experience, you know, because you're kind of your, your, your single point resource, do your thing um, and still fix jets. So I wonder um, if on the, on the flip side, if we didn't chew up people in their military service, would they be more likely to accept the PCS deployment rotation of AFITs? Because essentially what you're talking Probably. about is almost the best case scenario for a military member. There's, you don't have to write EPRs because unless you're like the lead AFITs guy, you have no supervisory sort of role. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no volunteerism requirement. There, no. I assume there's no PT test requirement. There's, no. you, don't, Eight hour days. you don't have to go to, you don't have to produce like, six credit hours a year for your performance reports or like there's, you know, it cuts away a lot of the BS that maintainers have to deal with and leaves you with the core of you need to be a maintainer. You might PCS, you might deploy. I wonder, cause that's like you said, that's working hard book stuff. You're not doing launch recovery. You're not doing these, these piddly stuff. You're doing the stuff that's really challenging that gives you that great rush. I mean, I'm sure there's like endorphins involved. Like when you get a jet finally fixed, like when we worked on that impound and it, took off and I feed immediately, like I was crushed. And then when I was asked to come back on, I felt like I needed to prove myself. And then when I got it, no kidding fix, the endorphins probably went through the roof. Cause that was like, Oh yeah. It's an emotional roller coaster. Tumor. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so like there's a, re- there's a real reward system in doing hard broke maintenance, especially when you cut away all the trappings of the bureaucracy of the air force. So if, if technicians are not interested, I mean, that tells me they're chewed up from their military service. And they, if they had maybe gotten out sooner or they're treated better, they'd probably be more apt to join AFITS. Yeah. Um, a lot of those guys, after, after 10 or 12 years, they're completely smoke checked. And how many times have you heard guys say, I just want to do my job? I just want to do my job. I don't want to have to volunteer. I, I, I just want to fix airplanes. I just want to do my job. And, um, that's the hard thing is all the extra bullshit. I was like, you know why this staff sergeant can't 
fill out his EPR with volunteerism shit because he's your most experienced yeah. guy and he's working 14 hour shifts. Yeah. He was killing himself. I remember when, yeah. yeah. I remember when I separated and I go work for Affitz and it's eight hour days at the end of the, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon, they're like, all right, head out. New shift is here. And I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah. They're like, dude, it's four o'clock. Go home. I was like, what, what am I supposed to do with the rest of my time? Like it was a shock. Yeah. I was like, I'm used to working 14s and killing myself. Um, yeah, those guys are completely smoked out and, uh, it just sucks, but okay. it's, it's the same problem we've had for years anyway, that you hear any, uh, you know, eighties era technician, the same shit. That's fair. So let's talk about, um, one Oh sevens. So again, this is going to go back to what I kind of said previously, like, just like I didn't know who Affitz was when I was an airman, I had no <laughs> idea what a one Oh seven was. Um, and I think the first time I even understood that there was some sort of higher authority or evaluator for safety of flight issues was back at Luke in 99 or 2000, we had some 341 bulkheads that were uh, chafed beyond or something. And we had to have 341 bulkhead changes, which gouged or whatever. Yeah. And it was like, uh, you can change that. I can't believe that you can change that. And there was, you know, 107 submitted and it seemed, and again, it's hard for me to separate whether as I raised in status and rank, I was privy to more things going on, or if 107 started, the uptick started going. But I think when I even went back and looked at 107s historically, it was like one per year per jet, maybe. And then mm -hmm. by the end, it was like lots per, I mean, because also you had 107s for egress system components being you know extended due to lack of supply and stuff like that yeah. you had which is a legitimate problem <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know get into that it's, well yeah. supply yeah <laughs> well i think also um there i think and i, I I'm, not, I'm certainly not laughing about it. i think there was a pilot that passed away a few months ago and it turned out that his all, all of his ejection system stuff was overdue, but had been extended. And then they found out that the part was actually on hand, but they extended it out of convenience to align it with, I think, an 18-month seat and canopy or something. God, I hope that's not true. I think it is. And I'll also post a link. And you know what? I'm, I'm so terrible. I always say, I'll post a link. And I never post a fucking link. Right. So, <laughs> uh, if, if you don't see the link, the onus is on you to Google this. Um, but I'll try to remember this one. Uh, going back to the 107 conversation, the amount of 107s I saw towards the end of my career seemed to go through the roof. And then for the first time, I started seeing 107s asking to help troubleshoot. What like what do you think about 107s asking engineers to help troubleshoot uh, something? Um, bullshit. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so what happens? Uh, 107s are band aids. Um, 107s are an excuse to put an aircraft into depot status for beam counters. That's all it is. Okay. A 107 for a gouged bulkhead or a uh, chafed egress line, that's legitimate. Okay. Some engineer is going to need to do some, you know, cosmic engineer math up it, uh, up in Salt Lake and to figure that out and what our allowances are. When they started using 107s to troubleshoot, they were buying time to status the aircraft is what they were doing. You know, it's interesting would, you bring that up because I hadn't even considered that, but you're probably right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Because um, they sit there and they go, how long has this jet, jet been NM? Yeah. Um, and, or, and they would have to answer to that. And then as soon as they published that 107, and it would go into depot status, it's out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. Right. And here's the funny thing is that 107 gets sent to a subject matter expert or an engineer at Ogden um, or wherever. And guess who that engineer calls? Affitz. They call Affitz at that location and they go, hey, man, what's the history on this? Yep. Because the guy writing the 107, is probably a master sergeant who has to answer to the group commander or the chief 
but he has no history with this aircraft or the troubleshooting experience. Yep. So the 107 is this thing is broke. How do we fix? And they're literally, I've read them that simple. So at Shaw, the 107s, you see the routing process for 107s used to have to come through Affitts and we would kick them back yep. and be like, this is bullshit. We'll fix it. And they're like, no, we want to push it through because we need to change it to devil status. Um, what a lot of people didn't realize is Affitts had an even better tool similar to the 107 called an FSR or field service report where we could go in and very detailed author a description of what was going on, what has been done, you know, how is, how we've we been involved, how long this problem's been going on, history of the aircraft. And it would go to dozens of SMEs and engineers up at Ogden or down in Georgia. So, um, but the FSR never changed the aircraft status. Oh, it's and interesting. So, but also, the, so, didn't the FSR take longer to get an answer to? It did because... Um, it was more robust in the research and the answers. It was a ton of... We would add a ton of information. I'm talking okay. like three, four, or five pages worth of technical data that these guys would sift through. And the guys would... Uh, the engineers or the SMEs would still come back. And I would talk to these guys every day on an update. What did you do? How did you do this? Um, you know, try this, what happened, what readings did you get specifically to ohms, voltages, whatever. And, um, the one Oh sevens for troubleshooting, especially avionics components were completely, excuse me, fucking useless. Mm -hmm. Um, they didn't do anything. They just bought time. That's they, they bought time for the bean counters in scheduling and it, it showed the group commander that, Hey, we're working on this. And I'm going to unpack the whole buying time depot status and MC rate for mm -hmm. anybody that doesn't understand that either somebody that's not in maintenance or somebody that's in maintenance that hasn't risen to the level to really understand how this works. So we're going to say a jet is possessed by, uh, you know, Av Aviano Air Base for 100 days. And yeah. whenever that jet is broken, meaning it can't fly, it goes into NM <laughs> status, non-mission capable. We're not even going to touch PM just because we're going to do a, a simple analogy. So let's yeah. say... For, and they go minute by minute, hour by hour is when it's either ready or not ready. So let's say out of those 100 days, 10 days are, 10 cumulative days are when it's broken, where it can't fly because of landing gear or, or radar or, or flight controls or whatever. So essentially, that jet was 90% capable for that 100-day snapshot. So if a jet sits broke for a really long time, let's say 50 days out of those 100 days, which could be five days here, three days there, 20 days here, if it's a long break, then it's at, for that 100 day snapshot, it's at a 50% MC rate. And if anybody remembers the article written that I wrote in October of 2018, uh, titled The Crisis in Aircraft Maintenance, where SecDef Mattis demanded um, that uh, the fighter fleet reach an 80% fighter readiness mandate, this is what we're talking about, where uh, these jets have to be available to fly 80% of the time. So if while that jet is broke, uh, much like what Nate was talking about here, if they go, if they submit a request to the engineers to say, help us with this troubleshooting, while that request is at the engineers, the the owning base can say, well, we are waiting on depot to make this decision. Therefore, depot is possessing this aircraft. So for 20 days, you're waiting on that 107, that, that disposition to come back. Now you remove those 20 days possessed. So instead of having 20 broke days out of 100, you've cut those 20 days out. And now you're at 80 days possessed, which are all 80 days are mission capable. Even though the jet broke sat, sat broke for 20 days, essentially you're going from an 80% readiness rate to a 100% readiness rate. So... What Nate's saying is in his experience, much of the time they went to the engineers, not because they thought the engineers could help them get a fix. They were trying to shift the possession of the aircraft to a depot status. So therefore the time was not ticking on while it was broke, which would give the illusion that the jet was actually more mission capable throughout the year and pump up their numbers. And what's really problematic about this is when you do this shell game for your, we'll say your own personal professional benefit, so that way supers have good stats and chiefs have good stats and group commanders make it look good, you're also telegraphing to the Air Force at large 
that the fleet is actually healthier than what it really is. You're hiding deficiencies in fleet health. So then when Congress or the general or anybody else goes to pull because they want to do something, they think the fleet is healthier than it is. And they say yes to the operations or the mission or whatever it is. And then the people that are barely getting by with a broken fleet are now tasked with a new thing because everyone in decision-making positions thinks the fleet's actually healthier than it was. That's the quick encapsulation of why I believe the term you said was bullshit or fucking bullshit or something to the effect of (laughs) trash. Yeah. That's the first thing that comes to mind when somebody talks about uh, 107s for troubleshooting is all I can think is bullshit. Um, The other one is uh, the other reason is, is supervision and whatever AMU aircraft maintenance unit is uh, showing movement and progression in troubleshooting. So when the group commander is saying, where's, you know, what's the status on that jet? Well, we're moving on it. We have a 107. Yeah. yeah, Um, yeah. And they would even, I would, and here's the thing. As soon as they pump a jet into a 107 depot status, AFITS is pretty much hands off. Yeah. Um, The troubleshooting, we can, we're no longer actively working that jet. We're, we're, we're removed to an extreme advisory status. Um, so I would have, we'd be actively troubleshooting an airplane and I'd go into a group meeting and they're like, yeah, we submitted a 107 last night. I was like, well, we were going to do X, Y, and Z today and probably going to have it fixed in the next three days. I was because I gave you an e-tech, you know, estimated time of completion that we were going to do this. And they would just cut my legs out from underneath me. And you're not letting your guys get experience. It's, you know, it was a vicious cycle. Did you ever see after 107 was submitted that the technicians and the, and the AMU would also throttle back because it's like, we can now back burner that because we're they waiting get, and we're not buying time on it. They would get frustrated. They would get frustrated because they, you got to remember these guys enlisted. We all enlisted to do a job. Mm-hmm. you know, and we like doing that job. So they were also cutting the legs out from underneath their technicians because they get excited about not doing launches and recoveries and box swaps. And they want, they get excited about learning stuff. Like, yeah. you know, how many times I've seen guys, you see that light bulb come on yeah. when they learn something and they're contributing, mm-hmm. like they feel like they have more worth. And as soon as they submit a 107, I'd have to go back and talk to them and be like, Hey, they submitted a 107 everything's backburnered. And they're like, man, you gotta be fucking kidding. Mm. So it's, it was kind of a, it was a nut kick to these, to these technicians working this because, you know, they get possessive about those airplanes. Yep. They're like, this is my airplane. I want to fix it. You know, how many times did you call it my airplane? Yep. You know, especially as a crew chief, Yep. you know, so it was, it sucked. And then there's also the added problem of if the 107 is submitted with sparse information, a lot of times what I saw, and this is just my experience, the engineer would come back with like, did you cycle power? Or I mean, maybe they wouldn't come back with something that ridiculous, but it would be like swap the deflick or something mm-hmm. that's like, hey, oh, yeah. I'm not a moron. Like I started with these things. And so then the technician who's been grinding on this jet for days or weeks is now getting instructions from the engineers, which technically possess the aircraft and now they're directing maintenance to backtrack all the way to step one. And that speaks to a larger problem that troubleshooting is so much personal experience. That's why when you have a hard broke jet, you keep the same crew on because yes. day in and day out, they know, okay, this is the symptoms I saw. And I can write the most detailed logbook ever, but that's not going to encapsulate all of my experience for troubleshooting of hearing the mm-hmm. sound, like seeing a delay in how a system operates, it's really hard to quantify that in notes. And by the way, when you work 12 hours trying to troubleshoot it, your notes are going to be semi-trash because you're tired and you assume you're taking it over tomorrow and you know what happened. And as long as your forms are documented for your maintenance, you should be good. But a lot of times, you know, we go to these engineers, they have no situation awareness for what we've done, where we're going, what the behavior is. So much of troubleshooting is being in the moment watching that the engineers show up and they, they, they almost run like this form, this algebraic checklist of do, and it's like, okay, so this is just the FI, but it's in an email now. This doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. help me a whole lot. And it's implying that I didn't follow the FI. As a technician, you get really frustrated because 
you they've removed your ability to learn because that's what we're talking about time when you're on a hard broke jet the day in and day out grind of fixing it is the experience you're gaining and if you give that to the engineers their their troubleshooting might have more educational background and more like theory underlying it but that does not it is not sufficient to replace the actual experience of the troubleshooter seeing what's going on and seeing changes in the behavior as you progress through tweaking this wire or doing all these sorts of things. Um, so as a technician, I would get very frustrated by 107s. Oh yeah. And, and, and that circles right back to the beginning of the conversation is why AFIT started, why you started seeing AFIT so involved more because on those hard brokes, because you didn't have enough people to do the regular day to day, to leave somebody dedicated to an aircraft. Um, AFIT's was the only consistency through the troubleshooting process. So we had to be more involved in order to see this thing through because they would be like, here's your maintenance team. And I come in on a Tuesday and I got a completely different maintenance crew. And I come in on Wednesday and I got a completely different maintenance crew, you know, and AFIT's had to be more involved because that was the only consistency through the troubleshooting process. Um, you know, as well as I do that, um, when you walk out to a jet and somebody else has been troubleshooting it, you start asking questions real quick. Have you done X, Y, Z, you know, because if I'm going to be brought in on a problem, I need to start from scratch Yep. and, and it's not to insult that technician in any way. It's just to, sometimes it is, sometimes it is, yep. um, because you know, like you have six questions that you're going to ask that, you know, they should have gone through because of your experience yep. and you get to question three and they got this deer in the headlights and they're going, Oh shit. Maybe yeah. I didn't do that. They went in the wrong and, direction all day long. Yep. Yeah. And, and by the time that's okay between a technician and a pro super or a technician and an AFIS level, when it gets to a one Oh seven engineering level and you give them such little information and it's basically like, Hey, help me fix X. They're doing the exact same thing because a lot of those engineers used to be AFITS guys. You know, so they do, did AFITs and they got tired of PCSs and they went to work at Salt Lake and, and Ogden and now they're engineers. So they have the troubleshooting. It doesn't matter what system you're on, uh, aircraft, computers, cars, it's, it's the same process. Yep. And, um, but yeah, it's, it was that inconsistency. I keep coming back to that word. That was just no, crap. And I also <laughs> say this, if there's any group commanders listening, which spoiler, there's not, but um i know one that probably is maybe yeah that's fair well i don't think he's a group commander anymore but um no. <laughs> if if you are having to go affits to lead your troubleshooting you need to take a long hard look at every single leader senior nco pro super expediter in your unit because you need to ask a question why out of these 120 150 200 people to include multiple mass sergeants running the production office do i not have someone that can do this that is a nightmare scenario mm -hmm. and by the way injecting affits and uh, uh a 107 is a band-aid for that moment but as soon as you're done you need to circle back and go what the fuck's going on where i don't have capable senior ncos and experienced tech sergeants that can lead this the question is do i not have those people or can i not afford to put those people on it and I would like to think it's the latter where you can't afford to, but I think the reality is you actually don't have people that can lead that maintenance. Cause I've been in that production office and I've seen other pro supers that, you know, and I've, I've gotten this soapbox before, like, you know, me, Nate, uh, a lot of people didn't know my AFSC, especially when I went to Holloman cause I became a spec section chief and they're like, what is, what is he? Yeah. The answer is I'm a crew chief, right? Yeah. Why does that crew chief know so much about my flight controls? And <laughs> because like, <laughs> You know, and also, I never worked an impound that was a crew chief system, except for that brake. But that was also just a brake, uh, brake control valve, which was like a quick fix. Yeah. But the main, that was mainly anti skid. I did nose wheel steering. I did flight controls. Mm -hmm. Like I had to get like me saying I don't know how to do these is not an acceptable answer. I have to no. And I would very often read the the GS on avionics or on flight controls and go. I don't understand what I just read. And I would read it again and I go, I barely understand what I read. And then I'd find you or another person and go, help me understand this paragraph to explain the system. And I had to get good. And there was a lot of supers that would be really good at their AFSC broke jets, 
But when an avionics guy would walk in and go, hey, we're changing the FCR again, they would go, well, is that the fix? Yeah, okay. Because the reality is we don't have this great depth of knowledge anymore because, again, we've been shortchanging people on experience and we've been uh, rolling it forward. And the overarching message for a lot of these podcasts are the longer we wait to fix the problem with experience, the more costly it's going to be. As we talked about with AFITS is going to be now recruiting from the pool of people that we both agreed are less experienced than 20 years ago. Those can be your AFITS technicians. I mean, I would like to think that the 107 engineer type people are always going to be experienced because there's certain requirements that I think will never be oh, lowered. Yeah. But what you're going to do is everything up till there is all going to degrade in potential and an experience. And now we're just going to be left with the jet is fixed by the engineers 107s all the time. Which brings me to the final point I want to talk about, which, and I don't know if this is true, and uh, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll kind of be as general as possible, but but I've, through my, my time in aircraft maintenance, I've learned that the new F-35 system basically is trying to do troubleshooting for the technician. Yeah. And I worry that what we're doing is we're trying to adapt from to an inexperienced technician community instead of shoring up our experience through time and the cost of getting our people ready. Because I am afraid that if the F-35 systems are designed to troubleshoot itself, the cognitive atrophy that's going to be experienced along, among the maintenance technicians means when there's a hard broke F-35 10 or 15 years from now, they are going to be gelatinous blobs where they will not have the foresight to know anything to do. Yeah. Which creates a dependence on in that we're we're we are cooking into the process a a dependence on engineering dispositions. Privatized maintenance communities. Yeah. Um and you're dead nuts right on that one because the manufacturer uh embedded the maintenance concept into their aircraft that they sold the air force is my experience and, and my viewpoint with the things I saw once I got behind the curtain. Um, the technician is going to be a box whopper. Mm -hmm. The, um, the company employees are without name and yep. whatever the company employees are going to be the hard fixers. And the guys that are the only ones, when I saw it, they were the only ones allowed to hook up the computer to the jet and download what was going on. Um, so they couldn't do a whole lot. And, and um, you're right. It's just basically you're going to have guys who change tires and swap boxes. And it's going to turn into a privatized experienced maintenance force which is which is going to be highly expensive to maintain very and very i'll tell expensive. you what a, a quick way you can uh, analogize this scenario is when you go to jack in the box there's a person that knows very little about cooking they know about like food handling safety they don't know anything about recipes per se and they have a computer that says when this person pulls up, hand them a large fry, a, 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 a hamburger, and some tater tots. Hand it out the window with some napkins and stuff. And then, so that's like what the F-35 technician is destined to be. What we need for like good quality work is not necessarily like a Michelin chef, but somebody that can like cook and know what, what sorts of things, in like I want to put, you know, turmeric with curry when I'm making this rice to have some Indian flair to it. I understand that yeah. or, or these things, not just microwaving things and handing it out. And that's what we're about to be. And if you ask somebody that works at Jack in the Box to make you a good quality dinner, they're not going to be able to pull unless they happen yeah. to kind of develop it on their own. But yeah. it, there's a real danger here that the U.S. military is, is going to become dependent like legitimately dependent. It's one thing to be, be dependent on the military industrial complex to produce aircraft for the military. Like I get that. The logistical undertaking of the United States Air Force building a jet from scratch is going to be hyper expensive, really difficult, and they're not gonna have the best minds available for it. Certainly not the mass producing capabilities. 
but it's important there's a disconnect there, there's a hard stop between the military industrial complex producing an aircraft United States military taking ownership of that aircraft and then maintaining it from then on. And that's not that's not going to happen with this new model. What's going to happen is these military industrial complex companies are going to create a dependence that the United States Air Force and all the other branches can't get out from underneath. Like, how is that not a national security concern? Like, that seems like that's a big deal. Well, and it's it's funny that you you mention it that way, because the origins of AFITS in 1966 and 1967 was to bring that troubleshooting experience under the umbrella of the government and not privately. So we were back then we were relying way too much on companies and paying them way too much money. So they figured let's bring our guys in. That's how AFITS was born. And now we're turning around and we're giving it back to the private community. And it even got to the point, like, granted, I'm removed from the program for a little while. So things might've changed. Mm -hmm. But when the 35 first came online, we fought to get those AFITS guys in that program. Well, you would think it was an act of God to try and get permissions to AFITS. And I mean, you want to talk about, uh, what was it? proprietary. That's the yeah. word I'm looking for. They, everything, every answer was, no, that's proprietary. You yeah. can't have it. And I'm like, but our job is to facil facilitate and troubleshooting, but they wanted to keep that real close because those engineers wanted to keep their jobs. You know, um, if they give that information away, like they did in the sixties and seventies, then the air force is going to develop or the government's going to develop their own guys to troubleshoot. Imagine trying to troubleshoot where you're not allowed to know how things worked. That was so I was actually an F-35 AFITS guy for a very short time. And that was the most painful thing I ever experienced. I, I'm literally going to work every day going, what am I doing here? Mm. Like this, this is, a, can I go back to F-16s? Because at least I had a mission. Um, very frustrating. <laughs> okay, Nate. Well, we're uh, pretty much out of time. But uh, I mean, we talked about, talk about a whole <laughs> lot of stuff. I mean, right over an hour. Yeah. Um, and normally I ask for final thoughts or a wrap up. I'm not sure if we have, if I have the, uh, cognitive space for me to wrap my mind around all the things we've said today. Um, but I guess if you had to have one takeaway for, um, how the maintenance community uses AFITS or the, the culture of the maintenance community, what would you say? If you're a maintainer and you're listening to this and you haven't troubleshot something for three days, you don't need to be calling AFITS. I'm sorry. Don't call AFITS five minutes after an airplane landed and tell me and ask me how, or ask that AFITS person, how do I fix my flight controls? Fix your jets, get in the books. I know they took 623s away from people and FTDs are few and far between. Get in your books and, and learn how to troubleshoot and save yourselves. Um, and AFITS literally you need to work that thing for three solid days and exhaust everything before you call the AFITS guy. Call them because you need them and they're very important, but uh, troubleshoot your jets. Yeah, I'll say give your people time. Like yeah. growth and experience takes time. And I would say to any AFITS people, be very, be very cognizant of that line between being proactive and advising and taking over maintenance because it might be frustrating watching people struggle, but that struggle is what develops technicians and those are going to mm -hmm. be replacements. And if you want AFITS to continue being the subject matter experts and those technical advisors, you are growing your future AFITS people with the staff students you interact with on the line and you got to let them, you can guide them, you can give advice, but you got to let them work through those problems because that's how they become better troubleshooters. Yep. For and the, also, for the you know, the sooner this stuff gets addressed, the less expensive it will be, is what mm -hmm. I'll say. Like if we had been addressing these experience problems 15 years ago, we wouldn't be in the position now and it wouldn't cost so much. And every day that we delay in recognizing the problem is another day that's gonna cost extra money in the long run. Yep, and for those expediters and supervisors out there, your job is to insulate your people and protect them for higher supervision and let them do their jobs. Yep. You know, so. Okay. Good talk, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate you joining. And uh, I think there's probably enough here we might revisit too. So if anything strikes your fancy, uh, give me a holler. 
absolutely. I, I, I find that when I listen to these podcasts, like when I'm driving around, which I don't drive around very much because, you know, it's the apocalypse, but um, <laughs> when I'm driving around, I'll, I'll think of new ideas. So if you do that, just give me a holler and we can do a follow-up episode too. And also, if anybody has any questions, uh, post them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer. Or if I can't answer them, I'll form to Nate and we can do a second episode. Yep. And if anything's completely off base and they have up, updated inputs uh that's great yeah i always ask for that but i'm uh going on three years removed from being in the military and um from what i've heard from guys still serving i'm pretty much spot on so uh, <laughs> that's terrible <laughs> yeah it is terrible uh but other than that uh thanks nate and thanks everybody for listening and adios <laughs>